Yeah. 
great way to begin our season of Advent. These four Sundays of worshiping together that point us to the season, not Advent means a season of preparation. It's not a preparation for Christmas. You're doing that. You're doing all the things that help you get ready to celebrate Christmas. Oh, it's more than that. For that group of people that we are reading about this morning, there was a preparation for the coming of Christ. For us today, it's a preparation for the coming of Christ and all that goes on between now and then. A season of preparation and welcome to worship on this first Sunday morning of Advent. You might be a guest today, you've come with a friend or with somebody who invited you to church or just decided to be here this morning, but we're grateful that you've come and hope that as you've made your way in, you will feel the freedom to join in with us in every aspect of our worship service. Thank you for being here today. In your worship guide are a number of announcements, and, and the folks who want those things put in the bulletin and plan these things want me to read every one of them to you because they feel like if I don't read them, that means they're not important. Trust me, if they were not good or important, they wouldn't be in the bulletin, okay? They're important and I don't feel like I need to read every one of them to you. I trust that your reading skills are above average and you can read those and pick out the times and the dates. And I trust that if you can't read well, you can find somebody sitting close to you who can coach you through. So do that this morning, a lot of good stuff coming up. Uh, I just do remind you that tonight at the end of our worship time, we will enjoy our annual uh, fundraiser cake auction for our student ministry as they're getting ready for our summer camp and mission trip season. This is one of those ways that we encourage them and help them you're welcome. You come, be ready to have some fun, spend a little money and support our students in that time of fellowship tonight. All right. We want to continue our time of worship, giving you an opportunity to uh, welcome some that you've not yet spoken to. Speak to somebody you've not yet greeted. Let's stand together as we do that. And then we'll continue with our procession. Be seated as we continue in our time of worship. Thank you so much.
I invite you to stand as we worship together. O come, O come, Emmanuel. no question about the fact that this is a season of lights. Christmas lights are a pervasive reminder of the season's arrival. With the flip of a switch or the plugging in of an extension cord, the darkness yields to a multi-hued palette of twinkling lights. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land the light will shine on them. Christmas lights are impressive, but they fail to display, dispel the darkness of sin, of fear, and of uncertainty. This year, Christmas celebrations are being met with political protests, pro-Israel, pro-Palestine, anti-Israel, anti-Palestine. The darkness of anger and ignorance casts a substantial shadow across the land. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it. Today, we light the candle of hope in our Advent wreath. The gospel message is a reminder that darkness will not prevail. Jesus is the light of the world and the giver of eternal life. Church.
be seated. We come to bow down to worship before the only one who is worthy. His name is Jesus. Matthew chapter 1. The angel came to Mary and said, You will bear a son. He will save their people from their sins. He's here. He has come. Will you join us this morning? As we worship him. Isn't he? Father, you know we've crossed over the line, leaving November in our dust, and we've bailed off into December. And oh my goodness, it just feels like the pace picks up exponentially. All the things that are on the calendar that are staring us in the face, all the preparation that need to be made, the experiences to be had before it's gone, past, and December becomes a memory. Oh, I get it. And it's, it's enjoyable in part. It, it's, it's fun, mostly. And Father, we want to be able to enjoy all that you would want. But it's a, it's a busy time and it's a noisy time. And it's, it's a very easy to miss some important things in the midst of it. As we celebrate Advent, as we spend this season getting ourselves ready, I pray that we along the way would would be able to somehow or another uh, step away from the noise, somehow or another pause for a few seconds or minutes and just listen to what you have to say. It might come in a song. We've heard some beautiful music already this morning. It might come in a prayer. It might come in a passage of scripture. It might come in a message. Help us to hear. And then when we hear, help us to have the wisdom to do something with what we've heard. Thank you, Lord, for caring enough about us to meet us where we are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
I love this season, and I hate this season, all on the same day. I love it because it means something. It counts. It matters. I hate it because we get so wound up in ourselves and in all that we try to stick into the season that oftentimes we get to a point where we're ready for it to be over with. And we ask, even out loud, will this ever end? But mostly I like it. I like it because I can see in the face of a child an innocence, a wonder, an excitement that they don't completely understand, but they know that it's good and they're glad to be a part of it. And that baby's eyes as she was ready to light that candle, just being a part of this service today and a part of this season, there is that anticipation, there is that excitement. It infuses us with a, an element of hope. And as we begin the season of Advent, that's the theme for this Sunday. It is a reminder for us that God is up to something and that God is with us. That's the overarching theme for Advent for this season. And today we have lighted the candle of hope. Where do you get your hope from? In this season, we attach it to a family gathering perhaps, maybe exchanging of gifts. You know, a good time, a party. Businesses will have parties. Families will have gatherings, Sunday school classes. We're going to get together. We're going to eat. We're going to fellowship. We might exchange gifts. We hope to have a good time and walk away saying a good time was had by all. Maybe we are a little more grandiose in our expectation of good things that would give us a little hope. Maybe there can be a cessation of war, a permanent ceasefire in Israel and Gaza. Maybe a resolution of an ongoing conflict, physical healing. Just something out there, that carrot that's dangling out there that, that makes us move on, move ahead. Hope. Hope. We began this morning in this season of Advent by, by looking together in Isaiah chapter 9 at a promise that God made. He made it to a particular group of people who were in less than ideal circumstances. It was timely in that he delivered the promise at this particular moment. Timely in that we realize that the, the promise, the hope for the promise doesn't always come in ideal times. The promise, the hope doesn't always come when everything is beginning to come together. Uh, oftentimes it comes in the midst of the mess, in the midst of the chaos. And yet the promise is there. And this was God's promise to and through the prophet Isaiah. I began reading in verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 9. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders. The rod of their oppressor as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning. Fuel for the fire. And in those familiar words... For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. And in a final word, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. 
It's a foreboding word. The people who walk in darkness, those who live in a dark land. It wasn't necessarily because they were in a political crisis. It wasn't because there was looming war on the horizon. It wasn't because the economy was down or the crops had failed. No, there was an underlying reason more powerful than all or any of that. And it is a reality for us as well. The darkness comes when men reject God. It's as simple as that. My way is better than his way. The people who walk in darkness, those who live in a dark land. For you see, a rejection of God necessitates a dependence on human effort. It just has to work that way. It's either him or us. There's rarely any other option out there. Oh, when we get involved, we bring a lot of different factors and players into the game, but it's still us. We're manipulating, controlling, making the choices, trying to find the way that we think is the better way. In Israel, it was an interesting time. And oh, by the way, I realize this is an Old Testament passage and you're ready to move on to Luke 2 and have angels singing and shepherds coming to the manger. But before we get there, let's back up into the Old Testament. And, and for a moment, read this passage of Scripture and realize as we, and if you want to back up to chapter 7 and 8, do that. You want to read past where we stopped this morning, do that. You're going to find this, that there are some striking similarities between what was going on in their world and what's going on in ours. And there are some interesting parallels between human nature in that Old Testament setting and human nature in 2023. Very, very interesting. At least it is to me, and I hope it might be to you as well. But the truth remains the same. The darkness comes when we reject God. The divided kingdom of Israel had come to rely on kings, on armies, and on their wealth. You see, they, they always held out hope that the next king will be the one. The next king will get us out of this mess, out of this quagmire that we're in, and, and he will take us to heights of glory that we've never experienced before as a nation. The next succession, rarely was it election, as we know elections, it was whoever the son was that was next in line after his father died or got knocked off, and more often than not, they got knocked off and died. The father would be killed and the son would be installed. He would be the new king. Hopes would rise. Everybody get excited. Uh, here we go again. And three or four months into his rule and reign, they were already ready for him to disappear and for the new one to come and take his place. It just was a difficult passage. Hope was bound to the number of soldiers and the strength of the armament because fundamentally they, they had to be protected in order to survive. Their boundaries were always being threatened by enemies who wanted that little piece of real estate, that little piece of property, who wanted to take over and use all of those resources for their benefit. So to survive, Israel had to have the soldiers and the armies and the armament to keep the enemy at bay. And then and only then could they breathe a sigh of relief and, and press on. Because you see, when the borders are strong and the king is halfway decent, decent then that's going to mean that there's going to be food, plenty of food to eat. Our homes are going to be intact and, and we're going to be able to live with a, a relative degree of comfort and stability. Isn't that what we all want? That's what they desired, whoever the king was and whatever the military circumstances were at the moment. <coughs> Excuse me. They wanted that, that sense of well-being that would allow life to proceed. Does that sound at all familiar? I, thank you, Mike. I... I I believe that it does. I, I am amazed today that, that we, are, we are waiting uh, for something to happen that's going to make our world a better place. But you see, spiritual darkness, it comes in times of success and in times of failure. It comes in times of strength and it comes in times of weakness. It comes when the lights are dimmed and it comes when they are shining brightly. It comes when when normal folk, we say men, we say people, and that same so, seems so distant, but it, it happens when normal folk get to that place in their life when they are more dependent on themselves and less dependent on God. We depend on men for leadership and wisdom. We rely on our material possessions as well. Focusing on our pleasure and our comfort, that becomes job one. And then there comes to be a general neglect of the truth. I, I'm not 
a, a doom and gloomer. I, I hope I've never come across that way. I'm not one of those prophecy guys who just wants to beat you about the head and shoulders with how bad the world is, so we better turn or burn, get right or get left. I, I'm not that guy, but I, I will say that here where we live, in our part of the world, we have enjoyed seasons where we were in the majority. The majority of folks in our community, Titus County, Northeast Texas, Texas, the majority of people in our world were God-fearing Christian people who lived by Christian ideals. Y'all, those days are past. I hate to burst your bubble or to destroy that illusion, but those days are past. We're no longer in the majority. We are now in the minority. And that number on the other side is growing. They're not necessarily our enemies. They're not, for the most part, coming to get us. In fact, they're content to leave us where we are as long as we don't mess with them, as long as we don't bother them. But they, that majority, are a group of people who have increasingly turned their back on the God of Scripture and have either fashioned their own semblance of a God or have they rejected him outright because he doesn't fit with their choices of lifestyle and values. And so here we find ourselves increasingly in the minority and the darkness is getting darker and the darkness is getting larger as it was in Isaiah's day. The people who walk in darkness, the people who live in a dark land, indeed. The more we live in the darkness, the more we are repulsed by the light. But here's the good news. None of this then nor now caught or catches God by surprise. There is not in heaven this, this moment where, where God leans forward in his chair and says, oh no, angels gather around. Uh, come on, y'all, y'all gather up. We need to talk about this. I never saw that coming. Boy, this is a mess. What are we going to do about this? I promise you, I promise you there has never been a moment in heaven when God said, I didn't see that one coming. God saw it coming. Now you say, but Clint, it's so bad. Why, why didn't he do something about that? Well, he did. He created us with a free will, the ability to choose. And then he offers us options. He offers us truth. And the lie is out there as well. That option is out there. Satan offers darkness. He offers light. Satan offers destruction. He, he offers us hope and help. So he had a plan. The second part of the text, that promise is revealed. The promise of God is cloaked, wrapped in the most humble trappings. What are we going to do? Hand wringing ensues. What are we going to do? God gives a promise. In verse 6, that promise is uh, filled out, fleshed out. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And you can hear the collective sigh. Uh, a child? A baby? Really? A baby? We don't need a baby. We need a king. We need a good king. We need a king who believes what we believe. A king who will be for us and with us. We need a strong king who will be feared by the others in the area. We need a leader. We need somebody with a pedigree. A child will be born to us. Where? Where did they say? Oh, you know what that other prophet said. In Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Podunk. Nowhereville, Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Who lives in Bethlehem? Who's got a, a palace in Bethlehem? Who even has a decent home in Bethlehem where this promised one can be born? Eh, sorry about that. One of those other prophets said he's not going to be born in a palace, not going to be born in anybody famous's home. He's going to be born in a, don't say it, a manger. Excuse me? Mm-hmm. You heard right, in the place where the animals hang about. Oh, this is good. We need a king right here, right now. We need victory. We need strength. We need to repel the enemy. And you're going to give me a crying baby. You're going to give me a, a nobody baby born in Bethlehem in the middle of nowhere in a nondescript location. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, some promise. To add to that, a little earlier in the seventh chapter in verse 10, in a conversation between Isaiah and King Ahaz, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David, 
Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. You want a sign, here's your sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel. Oh, this is good. It just keeps getting better and better. A baby in Bethlehem, in a manger. Born to who? You heard it. A young woman who'd never been with a man, really. And how does that work? No, a young woman, a virgin, who's never been with a man. She's going to conceive of the Holy Spirit and she's going to give birth to a child. And y'all are going to call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Sweet, sweet. It's exactly what I was hoping for. No, not at all, because it didn't fit. It wasn't the, the, the trappings of success and power and strength that they had dreamt of and hoped for. So the challenge for this Old Testament people of God was to remain faithful, to, to get it, to, to grab hold of that promise, to grab hold of that vision, and, and to keep moving forward, to remain faithful to God, even when we don't completely understand, even when we don't always get it, because it is the promise of God. The challenge for us is to remain faithful in challenging circumstances. Oh, we are, we're blessed, and I, I will not hesitate to point that out. We are, we're blessed. Uh, folks live in circumstances in other parts of the world, circumstances that you and I can't dream of. You see, our worst nightmare would have been this morning, what, waking up with no electricity, having to get dressed in the dark, a bad morning uh, when, when you broke a fingernail, a bad morning when the coffee pot malfunctioned and you didn't have your coffee before you came to church, a bad morning, you got a speeding ticket on the way to church, oh, bless our hearts. We are blessed, y'all. We are so very, very blessed. But that doesn't diminish the fact that we live in a world where there's a profound sense of hopelessness. I mean, I'm glad I live where I live. I look at those news videos, and I consider the source and what angle they're coming from, their particular bias, but I watch the news videos and I watch people walking around on the sidewalks of a major metropolitan area in this nation. And it's not a God-forsaken hole in the wall. It's, it's a well-known area, and it's a place where tourists would go to certain parts of it to enjoy the beauty and, and all the things that are there. But here are these people walking around, some of them not doing a very good job at that. Some of them are hunched over, and they're stuck in one position with a blank stare while others shuffle along as if they're 95, 800 years old. I have to pick a number beyond people in the room, and that's getting increasingly difficult to do. Shuffling along as if they have no energy and, and no desire to go anywhere. And then there are those just laying out on the sidewalk because that's their home, and that's where they were able to get after their last fix. That's in the United States. And they're not animals, they're people. And they got sucked into a lifestyle and sucked into an addiction that has sucked the life and light out of them. You say, Whew, I'm so glad I don't live there. Well, I, me too. I mean, I, I'm glad we don't have to walk over addicts on the sidewalks on our town square. I'm glad that we don't have to worry about uh, the local dealer standing on the corner down there, passing out his wares to those who are hungry for their next fix. I, I'm glad, I'm glad that I don't live there, but y'all, again, not to be a doomsayer, we're not all that far from that situation. There are people around us who are that needy, who are that hungry, who are looking for it. It hadn't gotten that bad yet, but they're looking for it to give them a fix, to get them through the day, to get them through the circumstance, to get them through the moment. Our difference is in degree, not in kind. For when we reject God and turn to ourselves, we're going to look for something or somebody. We strive to elect politicians who will be our deliverer. There's so much hope now for November of 2024. Oh, this next one's going to be different from all the others. 
We're going to find somebody who will be our deliverer, somebody who will deliver us from all the woes of the world and take us to a new promised land. Listen to me. Hear me clearly. We do not need a deliverer. We already have one. We, we cannot elect a Messiah. God has already provided the Messiah and his son, Jesus Christ. What we do need are politicians who will faithfully execute their responsibilities as representatives of the people and not get confused about the fact that they're not God on either side of the party line. We rely on a paycheck, stock market, mutual funds to provide security. And I, I get that. I, I like that myself. But the market is so fluid. Gasoline prices change from day to day. Again, I tell you, a sheik sneezes in the Middle East and gas prices go up 15 cents a gallon. It just blows my mind. And, and we, we want, we yearn for this security. Oh, if I, if I just had this much money. Oh, if I, if I just had this much in my savings account. Oh, if I just made this much money. If my check was this big, then I would be okay. And we're looking for that security. But the fact is we have, we have security. We need things, I get that, but we have security. Isaiah shared those names that, that Jesus would be called by, and one of those couplets was he will be called the Eternal Father. You know what that means? It means that, that when the world is bright and shiny and good and you are happy and sassy and fat and content in all you've got, he is our Eternal Father. But when the world is bad and you've lost your job and your people have turned against you and you are struggling to make ends meet and you are down on everything, our God is still eternal father. He doesn't change because things are good one day and bad the next. We can count on him being faithful and true. We fret over the latest physical ailment or social epidemic. Believe you me, I know. We, I live in it along with you. We react and we overreact. We jump to conclusions. This isn't mine. I, somebody else said this, but I love it. For some of you in this room, the only exercise you get is jumping to conclusions. <laughs> Prematurely. Because you hear something or you read something and go, oh, no. Did any of you ever read Chicken Little? Did you ever read that children's story? An ignorant little chicken. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. And so here's what good Christian people do. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Oh, dear God. Oh, dear God. Please keep the sky from falling. And God, I think so many times says, people, who told you the sky was falling? It was on the Internet. Oh, and we all know, even God would say, everything on the Internet is true. And I think he would ask, what did I tell you? But God, you don't know about pandemics and you don't know about stock markets and you don't know about, you just don't know about those things. This is all modern stuff. I mean, you, you know about crossbows and you, you know about bad kings. You, you know about that stuff. You got that. You, you got that. But God, this is a whole different world, really. Really, again, I want to go back to where I started earlier this morning. Isn't it amazing how much 2023 is exactly like that passage in the book of Isaiah is? Oh, things change. They get more technologically advanced, but human nature is largely the same. And oftentimes circumstances mirror what has gone on in the past. You see, our greatest enemy, it's Satan. And his great lie is that we cannot trust God. That's, that's the, at the bottom of all this. God makes a promise, says, really? Satan says, Really? God offers us hope and light and deliverance. And Satan says, has God said, isn't that what he did in the Garden of Eden? As Adam and Eve were standing there, Eve particularly as she's looking at that piece of fruit on that tree and he sidles up next to her and the conversation began something like this. Hey, Eve, did God say? That's all he had to do. Just introduce a little doubt. That's all, that's all it takes, just a little doubt. Is that really the word of God? Can I really trust the Bible to be true? Is heaven real? Is hell real? Does God expect us to live according to the dictates of Scripture? Has God said, and if Satan can get you or me or any of those folk out there who are on the bubble about religion or faith, if he can get us to ask and answer that question, well, I don't know. He's winning. And God extends the promise and holds it out there for us. But then the last part, and yes, this is the last part, a little 
sentence, a phrase that I often neglect. I often hurry past it to get to the end of the sermon, but not so today. I want to end with this. The passion of God underwrites his promise. There will be no end to the increase of his government or a peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, period. And then this sentence, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. You pull out your thesaurus and look for zeal and you will find a synonym, ardor. Oh, that's a good one. That's one you use regularly in your vocabulary. Ardor. No. Zeal, ardor. Oh, there's a third one and I think we can understand that. Passion. The passion of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. In the light of what's going on, what's our God doing? Is he disengaged, uninterested? Is he leaning back in his divine rocking chair, waiting for a better moment, waiting for something to turn the tide so that he can then begin to prevail? Is he? No. The passion of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Where do we see the passion of God? any more clearly than in the life of Jesus Christ. God passionately interjecting himself and offering us a promise through Christ. Christ born to a woman who'd never been with a man in an obscure and desolate Palestinian locale. Christ who grew up in a carpenter shop, not in a palace like Moses did even, but in a carpenter shop where he learned a trade. His life and ministry were relatively short, a three-year ministry, a 33-year life. He died the death of a common criminal, Some plan, huh? On a cross between two thugs. He was buried in a borrowed tomb because he'd not had the time to take care of a pre-need. He rose from the dead. Forty days later, he ascended back into heaven to sit at the right hand of the throne of God. Today, he is at the right hand of God, guiding his people and working out his salvation plan. And he... The God who came and who was with us and who died, was buried and rose again is waiting because he is coming again. That's part of what Advent is about. They prepared for his first coming. They looked forward to his birth, to his arrival, however it might come to pass. And we sit here today in 2023 saying we believe, we believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. One day he's going to come and we read the Bible and it talks about the dead in Christ rising first. Dead people coming up out of the grave, bones being put back together, ashes being reconstructed back into human beings. God in Christ appearing in the eastern sky with the sound of a trumpet, with the voice of the archangel. And we jaded 21st century believers say, yeah, 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 I believe. He's coming again. He's coming again. And until he does, he's up to something and he's allowed you and me to be a part of it. And we shouldn't just twiddle our thumbs, biding our time, waiting for something good to pop up on the horizon. We ought to live. Go ahead and live. Go ahead and live where you are. Go ahead and live the life that God is giving you. Go ahead and live in this moment as fully as you possibly can, trusting him, trusting his promise and being grateful for the fact that Jesus Christ is our ultimate hope. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this time of worship today. A time that, that allows us to reflect a little bit on what's up, what's going on, and also on what you're doing in the midst of what's going on. Father, I, I pray for us that, that we would resolve among ourselves to get on with it the business of of living the Christ life. Get on with it. The business of influencing those that you've put in our world. Get on with it. The business of holding up the standard of your truth and your hope. And I pray for him, for her, sitting here this morning, who's wondered if there was anything more than this world has to offer and it's finally crystallized. It's become clear, clear that, yeah, there's more. And his name is Jesus. I pray for their salvation. And that this might be the day of their salvation. Bless this invitation. Use it for your purposes. In Christ we pray. Amen.